What's happening, everybody? Welcome into Packers Game Day, a Packers Game Day edition of the Packer Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Maybe not the most exciting Packers Game Day of all time. Packers, Jets, Lambeau Field. That all sounds great, but of course, no Aaron Rodgers. There's probably going to be about 30 plus inactives again. And maybe the most disappointing aspect is it's unlikely that we're going to see Jordan Love. Uh, at least that's what Matt, uh, Matt LaFleur said on Thursday, that it was highly unlikely that he would play. I would be beyond shocked if he ends up playing, but I guess never say never. We'll see what happens there. But even with that being the case, there are definitely things that are still worth watching in this game. And as is often the case with preseason games, you're much better off watching individual players than you are actually watching what happens. Like if there's ever an opportunity for you to really take your eye off the ball and just kind of watch players or watch how things develop, preseason is that opportunity. Like the the ultimate score doesn't matter. Like as Matt LaFleur noted last week, they were playing cover two and and man defense basically the entire, the entire day. Like there's not, there's nothing exotic. There's nothing that you're going to pick up. What you want to see is those individual battles, especially in the trenches, one-on-one corner versus wide receiver. Like how do they handle those individual matchups? So I'm going to get to the matchups that I'm going to be watching for in just a moment. Before I get there, we did have one small, you know, roster move that I want to get to on Friday. So that move is, the Packers signed wide receiver Damon Hazelton, um, and they uh, released cornerback Dominique Martin. So uh, Martin was beyond a long shot to make the team based off of when he got into camp, making a transition, or has made the transition from wide receiver to corner, but uh, you could tell he was well behind the eight ball. And the same thing is going to be for uh, Damon Hazelton, right? But there, there makes a lot of logical sense as to why they would make that move on Friday. If you think about this logistically, all of their wide receivers that didn't play last week, you know, when you get to the the MVSs, the Alan Lazards, the you know the Devonte Adams, those type of guys, they're and Randall Cobb, they're, they're not going to play again, right? Also, you now have a situation where uh, you know Chris Blair is still out hurt, Devin Funches is now hurt, Jawan Winfrey is out hurt, DeAndre Tompkins they just placed on IR. So functionally, going into this game before bringing in Hazelton. They had four wide receivers that were likely only, you know, the only four that were going to play in this game. Amari Rogers, Malik Taylor, Equinemia St. Brown, and Reggie Begleton. That was it. You know, like you're, you're getting close to having to play KB Nento back at wide receiver where he played in college, right? Or something like that, because you just don't have the guys to go out and play. So bringing in Hazleton, even though it's going to be on insanely, you know, you know, whatever, short time in Green Bay to get to know the playbook or anything like that. Uh, it's still a very, very important piece to have there because they just didn't have enough wide receivers on the roster. So I would still expect to see him on Saturday, uh, even though he's brand new to the team, simply because, again, I don't think you're going to play just Amari, Malik Taylor, EQ, and Begleton through four quarters in that game. They'll still get the majority of the snaps, especially Malik Taylor, EQ, and Begleton. We'll see how much of Amari Rodgers we get, but um, having another guy there, especially should some sort of injury hit, you remember EQ is just coming back from injury as well. So this was more of a logistical move than a, a long-term roster move that's going to really affect this team in any capacity, but definitely made sense for Saturday. All right, let's jump to our main topic for today. These are the five battles that I'm going to be watching in this Packers-Jets game. First of all, I'm going to go with the offensive line, right? And th- this is, n- I'm not breaking news here. You guys know the battles here, but Ben Braden, Lucas Patrick, Royce Newman, John Runyon Jr. Seemingly four guys battling for two spots, could be battling for just one if somehow David Bakhtiari makes it back for early in the season uh, or whenever he does come back. And assuming everyone's healthy, there'll only be one spot for these four players, which is crazy to think about and just the sort of depth that they have. But right now it seems like there's potentially two open starting spots for that week one game in New Orleans. Again, assuming Bakhtiari is not going to play, which we don't know for sure, but let's say that's the case. It seemed... It seemed in a way like this was going to go the way of Lucas Patrick and John Runyon Jr. Lucas Patrick holding on to his starting spot at right guard from a season ago. John Runyon Jr. taking that step up to claim the left guard spot. Probably until uh, Bakhtiari comes back, then Jenkins kicks inside and you probably see John Runyon Jr. back on the bench. But Ben Braden got his name in the conversation early in OTAs and mini camps. He's been in the conversation this entire time. Now Royce Newman, very much ingrained in that conversation as well, to the point that I'm not entirely sure that Royce Newman isn't the leader in the clubhouse for the right guard position, so much so that they've now moved Lucas Patrick to left guard to have him practice there. And it now, like we're not there yet, but it almost seems like we're leaning towards 
Royce Newman right guard, and now the other three potentially fighting for that left guard spot, at least for the time being. So this will be a huge performance for Royce Newman to see if he can fully and firmly grab hold of that starting right guard spot. Well, for the other three, they need to get back in that conversation overall, but there could now be only one spot for three guys. So John Runyon Jr., Ben Braden, that ent- Lucas Patrick, that entire group needs a very, very strong performance. So that's something I'm looking for. And, and frankly, if, if the offensive line plays as poorly as they did a week ago, now Kirk Benkert's playing the entire game. You've got a makeshift wide receiver group, probably not going to see any AJ Dillon. We know we're not going to see any Aaron Jones. Like this offense is really going to be predicated upon the protection that they can get. And if those guys that they really need to play well, including Josh Myers and, and, and the four guys, the four guards I just mentioned, if they don't play well, this is going to get very ugly, very fast. And no matter what, it's probably not going to be the most aesthetically pleasing game in the world. But if those offensive linemen play play poorly, you know, we could be talking about you know, a, a potential shout out, maybe three, six, nine points. So I'm really watching that offensive line group to see how well they perform and ultimately who grabs those spots, uh, those potential starting spots for week one. Next up is safety. And this is another really interesting one because you've got Darnell Savage, you've got Adrian Amos, and those two guys are going to be the starters. But we've seen a lot of uh, a third safety in the dime package for Joe Barry so far. And right now that seems to be Henry Black. Now, Will Redmond's just getting back. So maybe he gets his name in that conversation. Vernon Scott had a great game a week back. So we'll see. You know, Vernon Scott's probably not going to play. He was out this week with injury. So probably not get to see Vernon Scott in this one. But I want to see, can Henry Black really, you know, kind of lock down this this third safety spot as as kind of the, the next, you know, really the starter in the dime, I should say. Um, how does Will Redmond get involved? He was in that spot in many camps and OTAs prior to getting hurt. Does he get back in that conversation? Does he play in this game? He needs the reps. He was a core special teams guy, but so is Henry Black. Um, Vernon Scott would be a core special teams guy. So would Ennis Gaines if he ends up making the team. So I think all these guys have work to do. And then speaking of those undrafted guys, Ennis Gaines, Christian Uphoff, both have had nice camps. You've heard me wax poetic about how good Ennis Gaines has looked at times in camp. So I'm not going to go into the minutia of that too much right now, but he very much looks like a player who could be a 53-man roster player. If he has a great game, now maybe it starts catching the eyes of talent evaluators across the league. And if you wave him, maybe he gets claimed. So a big, a really big day for all these guys. The talent difference between Henry Black, Will Redmond, Christian Uphoff, Ennis Gaines, Vernon Scott is very minimal, right? These guys are all similarly talented, all bring different skill sets. Some are better on special teams and potentially they could keep what, three of the five, maybe, um, maybe four of the five, but probably three. Uh, but it's really going to be worth noting who can get that dime spot as well as who gets those uh, final roster spots at the safety position. So definitely one I'm going to be watching closely as well. Next up is the starting corner spot. Now, I think it's very unlikely that we see Kevin King in this game. So it's not like we're going to get to see Kevin King and Eric Stokes at the same time and see who plays better. But I do think we're going to see Eric Stokes. And we heard from Jerry Gray that Kevin King was going to get his starting spot back once healthy. That seems to be the case where he's getting reps with the starters, even in the minimal team reps that he's seen. But so is Eric Stokes. This still seems to be a competition. And if, Eric, like, listen, I, as I mentioned yesterday, Eric Stokes has gotten a lot better over the last couple of weeks from where we saw him at mini camps, OTAs, and the start of training camp. His confidence is starting to build. Had the great comment from Devontae Adams yesterday. I'm really talking about how he reminds him a bit of Jair Alexander and Sam Shields. So, there's momentum building for Stokes. And if he can go out and have a really nice game against the Jets, maybe make a big play against uh, Wilson or you know whomever, that would go a long way into maybe getting his name in that conversation more. Or, or potentially, if they're still set on King, does Jair Alexander kick in more in nickel situations inside? And does Stokes and King play on the outside and maybe not Chandon with the starters? So those are all things we're going to have to see, but a big opportunity for Stokes as he kind of continues to be in this conversation for playing time and potentially starting reps. Let's stick with corner for a second because that final cornerback spot is also of interest. I still believe Shamar John Charles or John Charles is going to make the team as well as the top four corners who you know already, but I still think there's potentially one spot left for the other three corners who I think are ultimately vying for this spot, KB Nento, Kadar Holloman, and Isaac Yadam, who just got to the team. As I've mentioned, I am 
I am in permanent marker that KB and Ento is going to make this team, but I do still think there's a conversation here. And I think that Kabian still has work to do. I don't think it's like a locked up thing for him. I think in these last two weeks, he needs to show exactly what he's shown in camp and in preseason so far. He's had great ball skills. He's knocked multiple balls away. He's been good on special teams. So he just needs to continue that. But two poor weeks could change that quite a bit. Kadar Hallman, I think is the least likely here, but he was the number one gunner on punt team last week. And usually that is a telling sign. If you're one of the top gunners on special teams, usually you kind of make the team. So that's another one that I'm really keeping an eye on. I think he's I think he's really struggled as a corner. I just don't see any upside there. And I don't think he's good enough on special teams to make it just on special teams ability alone. So I'm, I don't see this being Hallman, but a good game from him, especially on teams, could absolutely keep him in that conversation. Then Isaac Adam has a ton of work to do, right? Just got here. He needs to show what he's capable of definitely behind the eight ball when it comes to knowing the playbook and just having to go out and all of a sudden play uh, really at a moment's notice. So we'll see what he's capable of, but a couple big plays here there from him could firmly get himself in that conversation as well. So another position group definitely worth keeping an eye on as we get later in the game and, and as any of those players are in the game and keep an eye on them on special teams as well. And then last but not least is that fourth edge rusher spot. So we know Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, Zadarius Smith going to be the top three, but who's that number four? A couple weeks ago, I would have told you, listen, it's between Jonathan Garvin and Tipa Naliai, but here in comes Chauncey Rivers, who is very much in this conversation now, who frankly, since he got here, has looked like the fourth best edge rusher. He's looked better than Tipa. He's looked better than Garvin. He had a sack on Thursday and a nice tackle for loss on Thursday to the point where when they went to two-minute drill and team activities, remember Zadarius and, and uh, Gary weren't doing team activities on Thursday, they go with Preston Smith and Chauncey Rivers as the starters against the Jets one in two-minute drill to end practice. He has definitely been catching uh, the, you know, the, the team's eyes. He's definitely getting more opportunities, and I'm really seeing if he can make the most of it. I mean, it's insane to think that he's waived before even the first set of cutdowns by the Ravens. Packers pick him up. He's looked good and potentially good enough to be their fourth edge rusher. So special teams, once again, going to be huge for Rivers, so I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on that. But that fourth edge rusher spot, very much up for grabs. Maybe a Delonte Scott can get in that conversation as well. But right now I think it's Tipa, Garvin and Rivers. And man, I'm I'm not convinced that it might not be Chauncey Rivers right now. So uh, just another one that I'll absolutely be keeping an eye on as we go throughout uh, this preseason game that may not exactly be the most entertaining preseason game in the history of the world. So that's going to do it for me today. I hope you enjoy Saturday's game, Packers, Jets, Lambeau Field. I know it's not the most exciting, but Anytime the Packers are playing football, it's a good thing. It's a fun thing. And I know you'll be watching as well as I will be. I will be right back here tomorrow to break everything down that happened in the game. Good, bad, ugly, etc. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. But until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!